Thank you so much, Nina. That was more than generous. Uh, and thank you, Nina and Kenny, for the noble work you do. And thank you, Paul and Erica, for your presentations. Good morning, everybody. Greetings from Atlanta, or should I say hi, y'all? <laughs> As Nina has suggested, uh, I was convicted and transformed in 1994 by Paul Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce, and his thesis that the largest, most pervasive, most powerful, wealthiest institution on earth must lead humankind out of the environment, our environmental mess that we are making. And that institution is business and industry, which also is the biggest culprit in creating the mess, the precipitous decline of the biosphere. That's my institution. 14 years ago, I said to a tiny, newly formed environmental task force of interface people, if Hawking is right and business and industry must lead, who will lead business and industry? Unless somebody leads, nobody will. Why not us? So for 14 years, we've been climbing Mount Sustainability at Interface. <laughs> that, that point at the top, symbolizing our goal, zero footprint. We call it Mission Zero. Here's our definition of sustainability at Interface and our timetable. We expect by the year 2020 to operate our petro-intensive company, that's for energy and materials, in such a way as to take from the earth only that which the earth can renew rapidly and naturally, not another fresh drop of oil, and to do no harm to the biosphere. Zero footprint by 2020, mission zero. Our plan for climbing this mountain is the heart of the book that I published 10 years ago, mid-course correction. That plan is still the plan. And my assignment today is to give you a glimpse of what that looks like in action. So come with me to the factory floor and let's look at sustainability in action. A mechanical engineer is commissioned to design a production line to produce the same product at the same production rate as a production line he designed and built 10 years before. The process requires the pumping of a lot of viscous liquid. This time he designs it to use 93% less horsepower, 1 14th as much. How can such energy efficiency improvement be possible? Well, this time he specifies big pipes and small motors to pump the viscous material rather than small pipes and big motors. He arranges to install the big, short, straight, level pipes first and then install the production line thereafter rather than installing the production line first and bending pipes here and there to fit them to the line. He's largely defeated the pump's enemy, friction. He now knows that friction varies inversely with the fifth power of pipe diameter and every bend in a pipe further increases the friction and decreases efficiency as does pipe length. Doesn't every engineer learn these things in school? Apparently not. <laughs> this, is, this is new thinking. And yes, the entire production line costs less to build and less to operate than the one built 10 years before. The engineer has practiced whole system optimization, new thinking that has evolved from just 10 years before. Another factory engineer, also thinking in new ways, calls his counterpart at the city in which the factory is located. The conversation goes like this. Say, Patrick, the city has that uh, unregulated landfill east of town. Any idea how much methane is coming off if you're going straight into the atmosphere? The city engineer replies, no, but I don't think it's much. Well, why don't you check? Okay, I'll get back to you. He checks, and he's amazed at how much methane there is and how offensive it is to the nearby African-American neighborhood. 20 circling vultures attest to that. The two engineers begin to collaborate, and a year later, a public-private partnership is solidified. The city commits the $3 million in capital cost to capture and pipe methane nine miles to the factory. The factory commits $50,000 to adapt two boilers, representing about 8% of the factory's total energy usage, to substitute the methane for the present natural gas. The two agree on a price for gas that's 30% less than natural gas per unit of energy. 
and calculations indicate the landfill will have a life of 40 years, which translates into a financial advantage to the city at present value of some $35 million for a $3 million investment. A further advantage emerges as methane is drawn off, the entire landfill volume is drawn down, increasing its capacity, enough to allow the city to postpone opening its next landfill for an estimated 15 years. This is win, win, win. New and synergistic thinking. To recap who has won, the city reaps a huge financial return on its investment, converting a polluting waste stream into a lucrative revenue stream and postponing the cost of opening a second landfill for years. An offensive public nuisance is eliminated and environmental injustice corrected. The factory reduces its energy cost and increases its renewable energy usage. The earth is spared greenhouse gas emissions that contribute 23 times as much as carbon dioxide to global warming. Methane is that powerful as a greenhouse gas. The factory, therefore, receives the benefit of a greenhouse gas offset of 23 times 8%, or 184% of its total energy usage, and now can declare its operations climate neutral. For a further modest investment and in offsets, the factory can neutralize its entire supply chains greenhouse gas contribution to global warming and declare its products now to be climate neutral for their full life cycle from wellhead to reclamation. Independent third party certified. The marketing arm of the factory realizes the market appeal of climate neutral and dubs its climate neutral products cool carpet, which becomes a huge marketing success, contributing incremental sales and lifting the company's image far more than advertising would have. Sure enough, we see that waste can be food in industry as in nature. In nature, one organism's waste is another's food. A carpet factory manager in Southern California where there's lots of sunshine muses over the possibility of using photovoltaics to produce some of the factory's electricity. He scouts around and discovers that state assistance is available for such projects and then he asks his accountant to work out the justification. But even with state assistance, the project doesn't pencil according to the accountant who's looking hard at comparative costs. But the manager doesn't give up. He asks his marketing and sales counterparts, can you sell solar made carpet? Something the world never heard of before. Without hesitation, they reply, bring it on. <laughs> and today, 120 kilowatts at peak sunlight of photovoltaic factory generated voltage is connected to the California grid and is producing electricity in such quantities that were the electrical current channeled to the tufting process of the factory, it would power the production of a million square yards per year of solar made carpet, generating incremental sales that the accountant overlooked in his preoccupation with costs and becoming the forerunner of cool carpet. Decisions made in the round, another term for interdisciplinary, including marketing, sales, and the customer, are better decisions. This new thinking is brought on by technical innovation of the new industrial revolution, the solar revolution, it has begun. A product designer. <clears throat> A product designer frustrated with a lack of progress in implementing sustainable design pleads, let's do something, anything. So a designer redesigns a typical product to have 4% less of its most energy intensive and most expensive material component, in this case, DuPont nylon. The redesigned product performs well in all the usual tests, so for the moment, this is considered to be the something the designer was pleading for. But an engineer thinking new kinds of thoughts wonders about the effect upstream of this kind of design modification if it were made across the factory's entire product line. So he asked DuPont a question that DuPont has never, ever been asked before. How much energy did DuPont expend from wellhead to my receiving docking, producing and delivering that bit of nylon? This is now commonly referred to as embodied energy. The DuPont response is applied by the inquiring engineer theoretically across the hypothetically redesigned product line and to his amazement and everyone else's. This turns out to be enough energy not used by DuPont, call it mega energy, to run the engineer's entire factory for two years. Today, the average product in this factory contains 16% less nylon with no loss in product performance. 
and the offset upstream is equivalent to 10 years of nega energy, the Earth's very great benefit every year. And for those doing the math, it's 10 years, not eight, for in the meanwhile, the factory has also reduced its energy usage. The approach is now referred to as dematerialization through conscious design. It's new thinking that considers upstream effect, whole system optimization of another type with expanded boundaries of consideration. The new thinking reminds each that, that each of our companies or organizations, yours included, is its entire supply chain. No one stands alone. A team of engineers, production personnel, and product designers collaborate to find another way to create patterned carpet. The conventional way employed for years by the factory and its chief competitors is to print patterns on plain colored carpet base. Printing is water intensive and energy intensive, therefore greenhouse gas intensive, requiring an aqueous dye application. Energy intensive steaming to fix the dye. Washing to remove the excess unfixed dye. And energy intensive drying to remove the wash water. Excess wash water also requires chemical treatment before release into the waterways. But new thinking suggests that the tufting machine that forms the pile face of the carpet in the first place has untapped potential to precisely place tufts of yarn of selected colors to form quite intricate patterns. So the bold decision is made to burn the bridges and abandon wet printing altogether to scrap the existing stranded investment. Left with only one means of creating patterns which the marketplace demands, Development efforts result in entirely new families of patented inventions, giving the factory a proprietary edge rather than a handicap in its marketplace, and a huge reduction in water and energy, and therefore greenhouse gas emissions. One of those patented inventions arises from the outrageous assignment by the head of design to his design team to go into the forest and see how nature would design a floor covering and don't come back with leaf designs, he says. <laughs> That's not what I mean. Come back with nature's design principles. The head of design, David Oki, has read Biomimicry by Janine Benyus. Biomimicry, nature is teacher, nature is inspiration, nature is mentor and measure. So the design team spends a day studying the forest floor and the stream beds, and they come to realize there's total diversity, even chaos here. No two things are alike. No two sticks, no two stones, no two leaves, no two anything. Yet there's a pleasant orderliness in this chaos. So the designers go back to the design studio and design a carpet tile such that the face designs of no two tiles are identical. All are similar, but everyone is different. Now how contrary is that to the prevailing industrial paradigm that every mass produced item must be the cookie cutter same, Six Sigma uniformity. The new product is introduced to the market with the name Entropy, suggesting disorder. <laughs> and in a year and a half, it moves to the top of the bestseller list, faster than any other product ever has in the company's history. The advantages of breaking this old paradigm, this insistence on perfection and sameness, are surprisingly numerous. There's almost no waste, no off quality in production. Inspectors cannot find defects among the... <laughs> among the deliberate imperfection of no two tiles alike. <laughs> the installer can install the tiles very quickly without having to take their traditional care to get the pile nap all running the same way. The less uniform the installation, the better. So he can just take tiles out of the box the way they come and lay them randomly. There's almost no scrap during installation. Even a piece tile can find a place in the installation and then the user can replace an individual damaged tile without creating the sore thumb effect of a new tile placed among the old that so typically, typically comes with precision perfection. Furthermore, there are no longer issues of dial lots. Dial lots merge indistinguishably, and this obviates the need for shelf stock, the extra tiles on the shelf waiting to be used. And the user can now even rotate the carpet tiles on the floor to equalize wear and extend their lives the way we rotate tires on our automobiles and make selective replacement of damaged areas. All of this is good for the environment through increased resource efficiency by design, biomimetic design. 
A similar team, also inspired by biomimicry and thinking out of the box, ask, how does a gecko cling upside down to the ceiling? The question arises in a session to figure out how to completely eliminate glue from the installation of carpet tiles. Even free lay carpet tiles need that 25 foot by 25 foot grid of anchored tiles stuck to the floor to create a repeating grid or picture frames of anchored tiles within which the self lay tiles are installed without glue. But this session is about getting rid of glue altogether to dematerialize the installation process. And though the answer does not utilize Van der Waals forces the way the gecko does, the answer is nevertheless completely revolutionary. A two and a half inch by two and a half inch releasable adhesive tape is applied sticky side up to the underneath side at each conjunction of four tile corners. The effect is to connect all the tiles in the installation laterally and then let gravity hold the room full of carpet tiles snug to the floor and in place. Sticky side up, not down, and only six and a quarter square inches at lat, less than 2% of each tile's underneath surface. The new installation technique called tactiles provides the market with the world's first glue-free carpet tiles and becomes another successful proprietary differentiator for the company and its products. Glue is a petro-derived devilish source of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and can contribute significantly to poor indoor air quality, but not so anymore for this company's customers thanks to new thinking, upside down thinking, geckos and carpet tiles, who would have imagined? <laughs> Seven examples, real examples of new thinking. This is industrial sustainability in action. Dramatic efficiency increased through whole system optimization, big, short, straight, level pipes and small motors, not the other way around. Waste is food converted to a revenue stream and energy source in a greenhouse gas offset rather than continuing as a pollutant. A climate neutral factory and cool carpet, win, 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 and an environmental injustice removed another win. In the round, interdisciplinary investment decisions justified not on the basis of cost ushering in a new industrial revolution, the solar revolution supported by enlightened market demand and astute marketers. Dematerialization through conscious design and upstream thinking the leverage may be up there, no one stands alone. Burn the bridges, abandoning high impact technologies for low impact and out of necessity creating new inventions and a better way. Biomimicry, how would nature do this? Think upside down. As Amy Levin says, the best way to have good new ideas is just stop having the bad old ideas. <laughs> new thinking. 14 years of this kind of new thinking and innovation combined with a determination to abandon the comfort of the status quo can produce unimagined results. And by the way, amazing reductions in greenhouse gases and other environmental impacts Yet it does not come naturally, only through extraordinary commitment. The status quo is an opiate, a powerful opiate. Breaking with we've always done it this way is hard. Yet I am describing an industrial company that did make the break in the total, absolute, wholehearted pursuit of sustainability and in the process is transforming itself daily. I know firsthand this is true because that company is my company, Interface. This is sustainability in action, new thinking, creating heretofore unimagined, innovative, better ways. What has it cost? It hasn't. Our costs are down, not up. The business case is crystal clear. It is without doubt a better business model. Cost are down, waste elimination alone, the very first target has yielded $393 million in savings over the last 13 and a half years, with more to go. More to go because we're only halfway to zero waste. 
Our products are the best they've ever been as design is now approached through the lens of sustainable design. Some 82 products are now designed on the biomimicry principle, no two tiles alike, and represent more than 40% of carpet tile sales. Our people are galvanized around the shared higher purpose of mission zero. That means by 2020, zero waste, zero harmful emissions, 100% renewable energy, 100% renewable materials, closing the loop on material flows and climate neutral transportation of people and products. And to complete the business case, the goodwill of the marketplace has been astonishing. No amount of advertising, no slick marketing, no expensive marketing could have bought as much goodwill. And believe me, we do not take it for granted. Goodwill is earned every day by doing, not by talking. And we're counting on it in the, in the downturn in the economy that most, almost certainly lies ahead. How far up the mountain have we come? Here are some eco-metrics. Net greenhouse gas emissions are down 82% in absolute tonnage. And this is versus our 1996 baselines, and it does not count renewable energy credits. Over the same period of time, sales have increased by two-thirds, and profits have doubled. Carbon intensity, carbon intensity, therefore, is down 90 percent. This, I would remind you all, is the magnitude of the reduction the entire global technosphere must realize by 2050 to avoid catastrophic climate disruption. The important lesson here, it is possible. Moreover, water use is down 75 percent. Fossil fuel derived energy is down 60 percent per unit of production. With oil at $70, much less $140, this translates into major competitive advantage for our new business model. Renewable electricity is 88% of total electricity. Nine of 11 factories run completely on renewable electricity. The goal is for all factories to do so. Renewable energy is 27% of total energy because we use, a, we use a lot of energy that's not electricity. The goal is 100% renewable. Smokestacks. Who counts smokestacks? We do. A third have been closed, obviated by process changes. Effluent pipes, 71% abandoned, obviated by process changes. Travel, the greenhouse gases from 175 million airline passenger miles have been offset with the planting of some 87,000 trees. Admittedly, there's a time lag while the trees grow. The company automobile fleet completely offset at a cost of just two and one half cents per gallon. Renewable and recycled materials are 25% of the total and increasing rapidly as the reverse logistics are scaled up to support the technologies that are now in place. The goal is 100% renewable and recycled. Scrap to landfills down two thirds. The goal is zero. 148 million pounds, that's 74,000 tons of used product have been recaptured at the end of their first life and diverted from landfills, precious energy intensive organic molecules salvaged to be given life after life. Since Cool Carpet's introduction in 2003, we have produced and sold more than 70 million square yards of climate neutral carpet, third party verified. Altogether, we're about halfway to our objective mission zero, maybe a bit further depending on how you weigh the individual elements especially greenhouse gases. Roughly half the time from start to finish, 13 and a half of 26 years have elapsed. We are on schedule. 14 years ago, when we set this goal and undertook this climb, people thought it was impossible. Some said I had gone around the bend. <laughs> a competitor looked me in the eye and called me a dreamer. Yet as Amory says, if it exists, it must be possible. It exists without one single government incentive. <laughs> Except, I would add gratefully, the equal opportunity to sell our products to governmental entities in a competitive marketplace. 
I say to you the entire industrial system must travel this road, but is it possible for the entire industrial system? Why not? If it exists, it must be possible. If we can do it, anybody can. If anybody can, everybody can. What is needed beside the willpower? Strong signals from the market, from customers everywhere that it includes you to the suppliers of everything you buy that say, this is how I make my purchase decisions from now on. And thousands of educated change agents to respond to those signals. The educational community has a huge role to play. A suggestion for government, an enlightened revamp of tax and subsidy policy, disfavoring fossil fuels and favoring renewable energy to get the incentives right. <laughs> that could help speed things along. As would a cap and trade system for fossil fuels that auctioned the cap rather than gave it away, as the Europeans have done. The Earth desperately needs for carbon to carry a price to begin to internalize its enormous externality costs and create Lester Brown's honest market. The challenge, of course, is that it's not someone else's job. It begins with you and me. Of this, I am certain. We cannot survive as a society unless we take care of nature, for she is the goose that lays all the golden eggs. Interface is undertaking extends beyond sustainability. We intend to become a restorative company, putting back more than we take and doing good for Earth, not just no harm. We think this will happen through the power of influence stemming from the success of our business model. So we've created Interface RAISE, R-A-I-S-E, not R-A-Y apostrophe S. -E, a consulting arm to accommodate other companies and other organizations that want to shorten their learning curves by tapping into our 14 years of learning peer to peer. <laughs> if you're interested or know of a company that should be interested, give us a call. For of this too, I am certain, we're all in it together. Thank you.